Here's the difference between a $30 and $700 valve cover leak repair, if you do it yourself. This is one of the most annoying and time consuming leaks you'll have to address. But if this is the first time your valve cover is leaked, you have two potential solutions. One is change out the entire valve cover for about three to $700, depending on if you want OEM parts, or just change out the gaskets for 30 to $60. To test which one you need, grab a vacuum pump. Oftentimes they also function as a suction, which is great for brake fluid changes. But for now, switch it over to the vacuum side and remove the engine cover. On the top of the valve cover, look for this port and remove the cover so you can attach your hose adapter. Then pump it up to 15 inches of mercury. If it holds for about 10 seconds, you probably only need to replace your gaskets. And I say probably because it is a plastic valve cover after all, so there could be some deformation there, especially if your car experiences extreme shifts in temperature, whether it be from the weather or from the track. In either case, I would just replace out the entire valve cover just to be safe. And I have seen some people on the forum say that they can get away with changing out the gaskets if their car is under 100,000 miles. But I had to find out the hard way on my car, which is just over 73,000 miles, that it required a brand new valve cover. So depending on how many miles your car has or the actual valve cover has when the leak actually occurs, you might want to change out the entire valve cover just to be safe. Once you determine what parts you need and they arrive, disconnect the battery before moving on to the engine bay. Start by removing the lateral cowl panels, which are each held in by three 10 millimeters and a push rivet, giving you access to all the 13 millimeters holding in the carbon brace. Then remove the lateral plastic covers and rubber coverings over the aluminum brace, all of which are held in by push rivets but one on the driver's side is blocked by this cover that is held in by a single T20 screw. Now we can loosen the lateral T50s, E12s at the strut tower, and the E18s at the top so we can remove the aluminum strut brace. The back weather stripping is just pressed into the rear plastic panel and can be easily pulled off once the wire that rests inside of it is removed. Unhook that same wire from the rear plastic panel, which is held in by seven 10 millimeters, four on the left side and three on the right. With that panel out, the engine cover and sound deadening foam can be easily removed to reveal the O2 sensors. Unseat the sensors from their holder so you can disengage the locks before separating the connections. Then remove the holder, which is held in by a T25. By now, the T50 positive battery terminal should be safe to remove because that cable will go over to the other side once it's free of its three retaining clips. For an easier removal and installation of the valve cover, bend the metal tabs that the two metal retaining clips hold onto away from the valve cover slightly. As for that wire that was in the back weather stripping, also shift it over to the other side after unsecuring the red locking tab and unplugging it. Now use some air to get rid of the dirt in this area before opening up any of the vital components. First of which are the ignition coils. Lifting up the top will disengage the connection and allow you to remove it. Then you can use something like an extension through the opening to completely take out the ignition coil. I'm also going to recommend that you store these in a way that you'll remember which position they were in. Now unsecure the three ground wires from their 8mm and a magnetic socket comes in handy here. Next, disconnect the fuel injector wires by tugging on them as you use a pick to lift up on the locking tab. And once we unscrew the three T25s holding down the wiring harness, we can also move it to the other side of the engine bay allowing us to lift up the rear guide cover that all these wires run on top of. Rest it along the cowl so we can have access to the number 20 and 26 bolts of the valve cover. Number 26 or the center rear bolt is now easily accessible with an extension, but number 20 is the one you need to prepare for. Nothing crazy, but a quarter inch E10 socket on a wobble extension is essential for this bolt. So I'll also leave these linked in the description. But for now, cover up ports 1 and 2 with a rag and place a couple more around the fuel line in the first position. Then with your safety glasses on, loosen the fuel line with a 14mm flare nut wrench. Go really slow on the first one, and hold down a towel over the nut in case the system is still under pressure. This one should leak out the most, so you can address the other five a little quicker, 
plus the pressure is released. Expect some fuel to come out of the others, but not nearly as much. So continue to cover up the ports. We don't want any gasoline pooling here, and we definitely don't want it in contact with the rubber boots of the ignition coils, as it will chew right through it, especially once it's under operating temperatures. Once the six lines are loose, the 17 millimeter of the main rail can be loosened, and you'll definitely want some towels here to catch the fuel. To unsecure the rail, disconnect the plug for the Valvetronic actuator, as well as the fuel rail itself. Then remove the wires along the rail as well as the guides that are hooked in from the bottom. Now you have access to the four 11mm bolts securing in the fuel rail. This is also a situation for a magnetic socket to prevent these from falling. And be mindful of the metal sleeve that can come loose from the rubber fitting. If they all stayed in place, use a magnet to grab them so they don't fall out and get lost. We'll also keep the fuel line on for now so it can act as a cover. On the other side, remove the two E6s so the Valvetronic actuator seal can be removed. If you still have your OEM breather hose, you only need to pull on it as you lift up on the tabs with a pick starting from the bottom. Hopefully you still have all four. For the front oil lines, remove the 10 millimeter followed by the support guides, then the T25 and the mounting bracket, which will also reveal bolt number 25. Now we can remove the fuel lines. Just make sure no threads are caught up and tilt it up and towards the towel to prevent any fuel from dripping. Then immediately cover the exposed openings. You don't necessarily need to use these caps, as fingertips of gloves will also work. But you do want these covered to prevent dirt from ruining your high pressure fuel system. This next step is only if you're replacing the valve cover. Unscrew the three nubs for the engine cover with a 13mm socket. The front and middle are pretty easy, while the rear you might find easier with a flex head wrench. Time to finally remove the valve cover, which you will want to do in sequence if you plan on reusing the valve cover in order to prevent any deformation. To make things faster, I just kept the quarter inch E10 and wobble extension on number 20 the whole time, as the other 25 can be reached with a 3 8 E10 and a straight extension. Once all the bolts are out, pry off the cover so it can be removed smoothly. When it's ready, place one hand in the back and one in the front between the oil lines so you can nudge them out of the way as you lift up. With the back cleared, move the oil line that runs to the back out of the way. Now you should be cleared to remove the entire valve cover. Before placing on the new valve cover, clean off the mating surface. First with a shop rag to pick up all the gunk, oil, and buildup. And don't forget about the three middle sections. Next, use a small piece of Scotch-Brite and some degreaser. We don't need much, just enough to lubricate the Scotch-Brite so it can remove some of the more embedded materials without scratching the surface. And lastly, wipe off the degreaser with a clean rag. Really take your time on this cleaning step as it could be the difference between doing this job again in a week or a couple years. As a side note, I started moving away from the red shop towels in favor of the white ones as they don't leave behind the red dye color. And now we're ready for the new gasket and cover. Just give the gaskets one more press into their channels before flipping it over and lowering it down. The rear should go down smoothly, but the front will be blocked by the wiring along the top and the same oil line running to the back. With those moved out of the way, the valve cover should drop into place. Allow the bolts to seat, then check on the gasket to see if it's still properly seated. If it doesn't look like this, just take off the valve cover, reseat the gasket, and try again. For the areas you can't see, use a pick as a probe along with gentle pressure. You should be able to feel if it's in place. If all checks out, give all 26 bolts a few spins just to confirm that everything is lined up. You don't need to go in order, but it is good practice. Because our next step definitely requires the torque sequence. As you drive down the valve cover bolts, the gasket will begin to compress and this needs to happen as evenly as possible, not just during the actual torque sequence, which is kind of easy to remember if we break it up into segments, and since the order has an opposing pattern. Let's break it up into five segments, from the perspective of the left fender, front, back, top, middle, or well section, and bottom. All bolts are E10s, and with the exception to number 20, all of them get eight and a half Newton meters, with the first bolt at the bottom front corner. Two is the top rear, three is above well five, 
4 above well 2, 5 below well 4, 6 below well 2, 7 above well 4, 8 above well 3, 9 below well 6, 10 just above number 9, 11 above well 1, 12 is below 11, 13 is the top center with 14 to the right of it, 15 is straight down to the bottom, then 16 on the left of 15, followed straight up to 17 at the top, then 18 to the right of the diaphragm cover. 19 is towards the front bottom corner next to number one. And 20 is the problem child that requires the quarter inch E10 and wobble extension. And I also went up to nine Newton meters to account for the wobble. Going back down to eight and a half Newton meters, 21 is the leftmost top bolt, while 22 is the rightmost on top. 23 is the top front with 24 and 25 just below. And of course, 26 at the middle rear. Now we can remove the rubber cap so we can bring back in the fuel rail. I found it easier to connect the lines in the reverse order of how we loosen them. If the threads don't seem to line up or have excessive resistance, apply some downward pressure on the lines as you thread on the nut. Then tighten down the six small lines with the crowfoot wrench to 23 Newton meters while the 17 gets 30. Also try your best to have the crow foot at a 90 degree angle in relation to the head of the torque wrench for proper torque application. While the mounting side is much easier, simply place back on the metal sleeve in the rubber fitting, then torque the 11 millimeter bolts to 13 newton meters before plugging in the fuel rail. Don't forget the guides and wires that run along this side and now the new Valvetronic actuator seal and screws can be installed. Just make sure the gasket is facing down and you will have to cut new threads with the screws if this is a new valve cover, but you will wanna tighten them in an alternating pattern to seat the gasket evenly. And don't overdo it. Hand tight with a folding ratchet like this is enough. Then we can plug back in the Valvetronic actuator and route the wire along the fuel rail. While we're screwing things into the valve cover, let's also do the nubs for the engine cover. Same rules apply here. Drive them in as straight as possible until you snug them down by hand. Next is the breather hose, or in this case, the attachment. That's still leak free with only two tabs, but I did replace my hose with this one that has a 45 degree angle for less than half the price of the OEM hose, and it's more durable. You just have to cut it to size and put on hose clamps. This is also a good time to blow away any dirt before we bring back in the wires. First the guide cover that goes over bolts 20 and 26, followed by the power cable that runs directly on top of it, then onto its designated guides leading to the terminal. The wiring harness is next and lays on top of the terminal wire in the back while having its own dedicated outline on the valve cover. And the last one is the wire that plugs in behind the positive terminal. Secure it by its locking tab before doing the same for the power cable with the T50. Hand tight is enough here. Then place back on the retaining clip. Looking at the T25s, four should have the coarse thread on the left, while the one with the fine thread on the right is for the O2 sensor. But test fit yours just to be safe. Since all of them need to be tapped, double check that the three for the wiring harness are lined up before driving them in. Again, hand tight is all we need. With the harness secured, we can connect the fuel injectors, which are nearly impossible to mix up because the wires don't cross over each other and should still be orientated toward the respective injector. While the ground wire only has enough slack to reach its one location, I wasn't able to find a torque spec on this, so I just did a quarter turn after my ratchet bottomed out. Maybe about 10 to 15 Newton meters, but if you know the exact figure, please leave it in the comments. Time to drop in the ignition coils and remember to put them in the same position as they were earlier. Each coil has a channel that the top lip will rest in, so drop them down accordingly and once they're plugged in, the top lever will engage, signifying that it's lined up before locking down the lever and pressing the ignition coil into its channel. Alternatively, you could install new plugs and coils now if that service is coming up versus having to open this up all over again. The O2 sensor holder goes into the bottom hole between well 4 and 5 and also needs to be tapped. Once it is, place back on the O2 sensors and engage the locks before clipping them in. The last thing that needs to be tapped is the bracket for the oil lines. Once that's secured, the guides can be brought in, 
which act as a hinge from the bottom with the 10 millimeter holding them in and effectively the oil lines in place. Time for the moment of truth. Let's plug back in the battery and turn it over. Just expect some hesitation due to the air in the fuel lines. You'll also want to let the car warm up for a little bit first, because unless something is really loose, a leak won't show up right away. There's also no need for a pick this time around, just a visual of the areas around the gasket and fuel lines will do, because if there really is a leak, it'll eventually drip down. Another location to check is the downpipe near the pre-cat O2 sensor. Oftentimes the oil from a valve cover leak will drip onto this area and emit a smoke as well as a burning smell. But at this point you should be leak free and can turn off the car so we can test if the valve cover is holding pressure. If it does, then that's a good indication that the leak is fixed and you can place back on the sound deadening foam. Hopefully yours is still in one piece. The rear panel has slots in the back for two of the 10 millimeter bolts so we can partially thread those in and align it easily before tightening down all seven. This is another one I don't have the torque spec for, so good and tight it is. The weather stripping has a channel that presses into the outer lip of that panel. Then the wire gets routed along the back corner of the rear panel, then into the channel along the weather stripping. The aluminum brace comes in next and slides right under the cowl. Only the E18s get 56 newton meters, while the three E12s and T50 on each side get 28. Now we can place back on the covers over the E18s and fenders, which should slot right in and are held in by push rivets, which is what also holds down the rubber strut tower covers. Don't forget that plastic cover on the left side before bringing in the engine cover so you can torque down the strut brace to 28 newton meters and finally the lateral cowl pieces. But if you want to see the full retrofit of this carbon fiber strut brace, or even the GTS hood, check out these videos, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>